Good morning, good morning, Rabbi Tai. Welcome to Breakfast in the Class. Breakfast in the Class today is sponsored by Bradley Cook, dedicated for a successful procedure and many healthy Banim Tovim for Avigail Batsara and Aharon, Yechiel, Michael. Hashem should bless them, Be'ezrat uh, Hashem, with many, many uh, happy and healthy children, inshallah. As well, the, the Breakfast in the Class is dedicated in honor of his fiancee, Raquel, sponsored by Erasmo Perez. And dedicated loving memory of Sammy Said, Lilun Ishmat Shalom Omer of God, sponsored by his son, uh, Isaac Said. We, of course, also want to dedicate the breakfast for the Rifuah Shalema of Rahamim Hai Ben Shoshana and for Mia Tova Bat Hana. My friends, I want to share with you a beautiful, a beautiful idea. And it's something that maybe Avi uh, and I were talking about after class the other day. We talked about this idea that so much of what we teach in Judaism is really about opening your eyes and seeing things clearly, about really being honest uh, with the truth that a person has within themselves, understanding the truth of their, the way they see themselves, the way they see their actions. And when a person has this honest approach to seeing themselves, all of a sudden everything changes. So, um, I want to re- read to you a beautiful pasuk. We all know the beginning of the parasha where Yaakov Avinu has a son. His son Yosef is uh, his ben zikunim. He's a son that was bo- born in his old age. He's also a son who, whose mother died when he was very young. He's old enough to remember his mother, right? As opposed to Ben Yamin who never met his mother. So, ya- Yosef's got a hard time. His father has a soft spot for him. He's the great stu- greatest student of Yaakov Avinu. He looks exactly like Yaakov Avinu. He acts in many ways like Yaakov Avinu. So, um, if that's the case, uh, we understand that Yaakov Avinu has uh, a love for Yosef and an affinity uh, for this son that really needs it the most. The other kids have their mothers, you know, or remember their mother. At least, you know, they uh, they uh, uh, unlike Benjamin. Uh, what's it called? Benjamin didn't remember her. Yosef was living with pain, with suffering. Would you not give that child more love? Of course you would. But the brothers didn't see it that way. And this extra coat, the Gemara says, that in the, in the uh, merit, so to speak, euphemistically, yeah, in the merit of the two pounds worth of wool that it took uh, Yaakov Avinu to make this coat, um, the uh, Yosef was sold to Egypt. The whole Jewish people went down into exile. You know, we talk about the, the ramifications of the hatred that was fomented in his brothers, causing him to sell him and ultimately um, to go down to Egypt in, in, in the aftermath. So we understand all of this. We know the story. We know the dreams. We know the brothers. We know that the brothers also, why did they treat him so harshly? Because they felt he was trying to push them out. Right? You, you know, I always point this out. You look back at the historical precedent, you know, Abraham has two sons, right? His two sons are Isaac, Ishaq, Ishmael. What happens to Ishmael? Rahet. Who's the continuation of the Jewish people? Yitzhak. Not the sons of Keturah, not the sons of, not Ishmael, only Yitzhak. Yitzhak has two sons, Yaakov and Esav. What happens to Esav? Rahet, out, leaves, goes. The Jewish people, the line continues only through Yaakov. So it's understandable that when Yosef seemed to indicate that he was going to be the primary brother, the best, the favorite, the whatever, that what happened to the brothers? The brothers said, this guy is trying to push us out. He's telling our father that we're doing all these bad things, which they, by the way, were not doing. He didn't understand it properly. He exaggerated it, right? So he went and he brought dibatam ra'a el avihem. He brought bad reports about the brothers to his father. So the boys, the shivatim saw that what Yosef was doing was just like the halakha of a rodef. If someone is coming to kill you, you're allowed to stand up and kill him first to protect yourself. If that's true in a spiritual, in a physical sense, it's also true in a spiritual sense. If someone's trying to push you out the door, you're allowed to come and say and do something to be able to protect yourself. You don't need to let them walk all over you. So the, Jew, the brothers, what did they do? They, they were trying to get Yosef out of the picture so he wouldn't eliminate them from being a part of the Jewish people. 
with all of the cheshbonot, and with all of the answers, and with all of the excuses, and with all of the reasons, and with all of the rodef, and with all of the bet din that they make, and with all of the fact that they even make a shivu'ah, a swear between all of them, and they include in their shivu'ah none other than Yitzhak, their grandfather. They include in the shivu'ah none other than Bore Olam himself. They swear to one another that no one will share their secret with Yaakov. And they wind up including and f- enforcing in their Shibu'ah God himself. So God doesn't tell Yaakov, Nivu'ah, you looking for your son? I'll tell you where he is. Yaakov's Navi. But all 22 years, he has no idea where Yosef is. With all of this backstory, I want to read you three words. The Pasuk says, Vayikane'u bo Echav. And his brothers were jealous of him. Now, that sounds <laughs> that sounds like an oversimplification. Come on, right? You know, that's a little bit, right? That's it. That's how you're defining this. They were jealous of him. So I want to read you an unbelievable Pasuk. The Pasuk says from Shalom Amelech, Viraiti ani et kol amal. I saw all of the work, ve'et kol kishron ha'maaseh, and all of the uh, the skill done in people's developing work. So, in other words, I see how people work so hard. I see how they innovate. I see how they have technological and you know and industrial revolutions. I see it all. Kihi kin at ish mereehu. It's all just the jealousy of one man to his friend. If all we needed was a blanket to make us warm, all we needed was a little bit of bread, a little bit of water to sustain ourselves, we wouldn't have to work so hard. We would not have the spirit, the pursuits that we have. The luxuries that we have necessitate us working all day long. The way, we don't have one pair of clothing. You know, we have 75 pairs of shoes. We go on this vacation, that vacation. We have to drive this car and this car. We have to do all these things that we need to do, right? Those are the things that keep us working. And by the way, into our old age. They don't, we don't have time for Torah. We don't have time for mitzvot. We don't have time for chesed. Look, how long you want to say? I got to go make a living. It's not a living that you have to make. It's a lifestyle. Rabbi, well, I got to go make a lifestyle, people should say. Right? Shilomo HaMelech says, actually, if you were just content with the basic things in life, we wouldn't have to work. Humanity would not have to work so hard. But it's because we need to keep up with the Joneses that we have to wear this and we have to buy that and we have to go here and we have to have seen this. So the kin'ah becomes this great, the jealousy of man to man becomes this engine that pushes the world to work so hard. Um, I remember seeing uh, a, a unbelievable line uh, in Apirion Shilomo. He writes, in the name of Rav, uh, Rav Lefkowitz from Benebrak, Rav Michal Yehuda Lefkowitz wrote that if not for jealousy, if not for the jealousy of man to man, you'd be able to hear a bee buzzing ten blocks away. The noise, the hubbub, what are you hearing? You're hearing the sounds of greed and jealousy. That's not remarkable. It's remarkable. Says the Pasuk, the brothers have a trillion and one answers. But end of the day, what is it? You know, sometimes when you're sitting with someone and they're telling you they you know an issue, they're talking about a problem, right? I remember once, I'll just I'll share with you. And once a man came with came to me. And he's telling me about how, you know, is he comes from a family, they've got, you know, a few brothers, and they're all part of the family business, and this, that, and the other. And, uh, and his one, you know, two, of the, two or three of the brothers, I don't remember how many, you know, they were promoted in the company, and now they're running their own divisions. And he, he's not running his own division. So what's it called? <clears throat> so he said, so I decided to leave the company. I'm leaving the family business. Rabbi, it's causing all sorts of shalom bayit issues. My father wants me to stay. My brothers want me to stay. My wife wants me to stay. My in- everyone wants me to stay. He says, but I can't, I can't, I gotta go. 
So I said, why? He goes, look, I think that there's more opportunity for me elsewhere. And, you know, I'm thinking that maybe a good change of industry, a change of pace is going to be good for me. And maybe I feel a little bit stagnant. And I, and I said to him, and I said, and, 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 also, and also you're angry that your other brothers got C-suite and, and you didn't, right? And also that. He goes, he goes, well, I'm sure that's part of the picture. I said, I said, look, nobody's here. There's no microphones. I'm not going to tell anyone. I'm not going to tell anyone. This is not, but let's just admit in this room together that that's not part of the problem. That's the problem. And, and, and there's no shame in saying that that's the problem. I'm upset because I feel I worked as hard as my brothers and they got the promotion. I didn't. There's no shame in saying that. But he has to concoct so many stories just in order not to say the one sentence that actually is the entire point. And over here, <laughs> right? Now, again, I want to point this out. I'm not trying to bash on someone. I'm not trying to, you know, mitigate a person who feels very badly about how things turned out in his life. All I'm saying is, the Pasuk is saying, let's call a spade a flipping spade. What are you really feeling? What is really the conversation about? You know, couples go to therapy. Sometimes they go to therapy for years. And you, you know why they go to therapy for years? So that at the end of five years of therapy, finally the husband or the wife could say what the actual problem is. And then the therapist closes the book and says, I feel like we've made real progress today. <laughs> Can I give you a ride in the car that you guys bought? <laughs> You understand how many layers do we have to peel in order for someone to actually just come out with the issue? But the Torah is trying to teach us a healthier approach to this. If this is what it is, this is what it is. I want to give you a beautiful example from the Midrash. Amen. The Midrash says that when Moshe Rabbeinu was supposed to pass away, he prays 515 times to go into the land of Israel. HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells him, you can't go into the land of Israel. It's time for Yahushua to take over. Yahushua is going to do it. You can't lead the Jews in. Moshe says, look, I'll make you a deal, Hashem. Deal or no deal. Okay? I get it. In, in suitcase number one is Moshe dies. Fine. But how about in suitcase number two? In suitcase number two, Yahushua takes over. And I will become Yehoshua's student. So I didn't lead the Jewish people in, just like you said. Yehoshua led the Jewish people in. I just walked in like a lamb. Listen to the Midrash. Hashem says, okay. So Yehoshua is now the Navi. He's now the prophet. And Moshe is a student. Yehoshua goes into the Ohel. He goes into the Ohel Moed. And God speaks to Yehoshua. He comes out. To his rabbi, who is now his student, and Moshe says, Ma What prophecy did you just receive? What did God, what did he tell you? Yoshua turns to Moshe and he says, Kisha When you were the prophet and you went into the, uh, the oil moed and God spoke to you, did I ever ask you what you heard? Yoshua would hear what his rabbi Moshe heard in the Oil Moed. He says, now that I'm the Nabi and you're outside, you don't hear what Hashem is telling me like I heard when God was speaking to you? Now, there's many answers to this question. One of the answers is that the reason why Yoshua needed to hear the Nebuah that was given to Moshe was because he was going to be the next prophet. He was going to be the next leader. Whereas here, Yo, Moshe doesn't need to hear what Yahushua is saying. Why? Because his, his term is already over. Okay? Many answers to this question. But the Vilna Gaon says, <laughs> what kind of student would say that to their rabbi? Well, when you were in charge, I heard the Nebuah, 
So what's going on that you can't hear, you know, what's happening? Uh, Moshe is like, oh, my AirPods didn't sync. I don't know. Right? But, you know, what, what, is, what is happening here? Why would Yahushua say that? Put Moshe on the spot. Says the Vilna Gaon, this was the Nivu'ah. The Nivu'ah to Yahushua was, go out and say to Moshe, did you not hear what Hashem said to me? Because when I was your student, I used to hear it. What does Moshe respond? Listen to this. And this is Moshe Rabbeinu, the greatest human that ever lived. Moshe says, Me'a mitot velo kin'a ehat. I would rather die a hundred deaths than to experience one feeling of kin'a, of jealousy. And with that, he's ready to go. And he checks out. I want you to hear this. Hashem wanted to show Moshe, why did I not think of this solution? That you should be the student. Why did I not think of it? Because that's very difficult to bear. And you know what happens when he plays out the scenario as Hashem tells Yoshua according to the Vilna Gaon? Moshe says, you know what, God, you're right. <laughs> A thousand times kill me. No, I don't want to feel this way. I don't want to feel this cannot. But Moshe is capable of calling a spade, a spade. I'm jealous. I don't want to feel like this. It's not the right thing to feel. I don't want to become this person. I'd rather die, Hashem, take me. Is this clear? Most of the things that we can't admit that we feel, most of the truths that we hide from, are because we feel that those truths are beneath us. What I'm going to say, it bothered me, that the guy called the other guy first? Well, I'm going to say that it bothered me that they asked the other rabbi to do the wedding? Well, I'm going to say that. Makes me look like a petty. Makes me look... I don't want to say that. I'm not going to admit that. I want to say that I was insulted that they gave, you know, Hatan Torah to this guy. Well, I don't, you know what? I don't need, the rabbi comes over. Look, we really were thinking about it. Rabbi, no excuses necessary. You know, it's fine. I don't really even care about the Hatan Torah. Really, I'm, I'm just passing through. <laughs> What is this bravado? You're not allowed to feel bad about anything at any time? You're allowed. Moshe Rabbeinu was allowed to say, this makes me feel jealous. I don't want to feel this. Me'amitot. The thing he prayed for 515 times. Moshe then turns around and says, I don't even want it. I don't want it. I don't want it, Hashem. If this is the price tag, if this is what it's going to make me, I don't want it. You know, sometimes a person realizes in the process of their life that some of the things they were chasing really hard are actually not good for them at all. Not necessarily not good for them in any way. It might bring them a lot more money. It might bring them a lot more. I remember one guy, uh, he came to me after switching careers. He said, Rabbi, I'm thinking of switching careers. I was like, I feel like deja vu. He says, what do you mean, Rabbi? I said, you were in my office not two months ago telling me that you wanted to switch careers and you switched careers. I said, is it going that badly? He says, Rabbi, I'll tell you the truth. I said, finally, Sheikh Yanu. <laughs> he says, it's not going badly. He said, it's going amazing. He says, but I am afraid of myself. I'm doing very well. The industry is amazing. I'm not going to get way into where he was. The industry is amazing. I'm killing it. But in two seconds, Rabbi, he says, I could see that the person that I've been working so hard to become, out the window, the way I'm talking at work, because that's the way people in this business, that's how they talk. The things I'm willing to do to people who are my friends, because that's how they do, that's how it's done in this industry. I caught myself in two months becoming a person that I, that was the person that I used to hate. Rabbi, I need to switch careers again. Moshe Rabbeinu prays so hard for this. And then when it comes to one version of the answer that can get him what he wants, he can get him to edit Israel this way. Moshe says it's not worth it. It's not worth it because he can be honest with himself. So what happens when we're honest with ourselves? It's a problem that you're jealous. Most people are jealous. 
It's a problem that you have desires to do the wrong thing. Most people have desires to do the wrong thing. It's a problem that you feel, you know, a little, you, 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 re, you need some, you like the kavod. It's a problem. Most people like kavod. I was thinking the other day, we say, Bechalo. How do we say it? Bechalo. How do we sing it? Give, it, give us a rendition, Yiga. Kulo Omer Kavod. Right? That's what we all sing it. I was thinking to myself, Ya Eni. Ubehechalo, and in God's temple, kulo omer kavod. The literal translation means everyone says kavod to Hashem. But I think sometimes it's everyone wants to know where's my seat. Kulo omer kavod. Everyone's running after. Shemit Nadev, $75,000. Yenstem. Matinati Ado is not usually, my friends, because the guy wanted to give so much money, he was embarrassed of saying it publicly. Usually, Matinat Yado is a very small hand. Okay? I'm just going to say. Right? People like the kavod. People like to say what they gave. They like to, and we have a lot of reasons why. I want to encourage others to give. You know what? It's probably true. Is it not also true that you enjoy that? Is that not okay? That we are human beings and that we have these desires? What do we expect ourselves to be? That we can't be truthful. I get, you know, you don't want to say in the therapy session that you got angry at your wife. Why? Because whatever. Like, it's just simple. I had a couple fighting. The guy turns out, well, the guy was angry that he got home and his dinner, dinner wasn't, he was hungry. He worked the whole day. He, the guy didn't eat breakfast, didn't eat lunch. Dinner wasn't ready when he gets home. Every time she's busy with all these other things. She's yelling and screaming. What are you talking about? I'm sitting at home. I have all the kids. You came home from work. You want food? Order it from wherever. Don't come home expecting. I have a whole house to manage. They're yelling and screaming at each other. The guy lost it. Uh, sorry? He lost it. He, he, but he, he went crazy over, the, over this. And I just asked him. I said, are you angry at her? Or are you just hangry? You're hungry, so you're angry. You know what? I have an p- amazing answer. Amazing answer to all your shalom by your problems. It's called Uber Eats. <laughs> now, what do I mean by that? I don't mean that the guy is not right, the girl. Everyone's right in the scenario. Everyone's right and everyone's wrong. Everyone's right and everyone's wrong. But it just takes an honesty to be able to say, well, look, are you angry at me or are you just angry? Did I do something wrong? Like, was I, was I sitting here watching, you know, uh, some, you know, uh, TV drama? That's why I didn't have everything. That's why. Do you think I don't care about the fact that you... It's not why this is the case. But we can't, we can't be honest because it makes us seem... It makes us feel small. Says the Pasuk, Who we talking about? The Shifteya. The tribes of Israel. The greatest. Moshe Rabbeinu. Me'amitot velo kinachat. Moshe Rabbeinu. If it could happen to them, can it happen to us? Rabbi Utai, the only way things change is when we admit that there's an issue. So the first step is short, simple to the point. If I was brave enough and no one would know and I wasn't ashamed, you know, what could I say is the root of my issue? And I don't need the whole stories. Rodef, Bedin, dreams, coat. Heke, this, my father, my brother. I'm jealous. It bothers me that I, I see you dream. I wish it didn't bother me. Say that. But it does. I wish it didn't, but it does. The only challenge is that we've created a scenario where we don't say the truth. So therefore, the other person also can't accept the truth. If you said it. Because so long... We've been with the stories. You ever meet with an old school guy who's upset at you? How long does it take for him to tell you why he's upset at you? One second. You meet with a new school guy. The guy says, well, let me start at the beginning. (laughs) 94 year story he's got to tell you about. Right? The old guy says, I don't feel like you respect me. Kharas, done. That's the end of the story. Emet, let's just get back to being able to truly call spades, spades what they are, and our behavior, and the way we feel about others. And when we do that, um, unfortunately, um, we manage actually 
by calling out the problem to achieve half of the solution. Baruch Adonai Amen, amen.